Revelation chapter 12. So I already explained to you who the woman represented. So the woman represented the nation of Israel. And then there's another wonder in heaven, and that is the great red dragon. This great red dragon, as he comes out, the Bible says that he had seven heads. So this guy is some kind of <laughs> insane creature. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All right. So you see right over here this crazy creature that's like a hydra, so to speak. And the Bible says that he had ten horns. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So what does this mean? Let's look at the main text. Oh, just perfect. All right. So let's look at our main text. Verse three. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Okay, another wonder that we're seeing up in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, right, having seven heads and ten horns. It was already drawn out. And seven crowns upon his head. So he also was wearing seven crowns. So each cr crown, that means it's representing a king. See that? So then we see here seven kings. So that's what it means then so far. What it means so far is that there are seven kings that Satan has used. So the question now is, who is this seven-headed dragon and ten-horned antichrist? So what they represent is undoubtedly one world kings and one world kingdoms. That's how we're going to find out the interpretation of seven heads. How you find out the interpretation of seven heads is because of the crowns on his head. And because of the crowns on his head, we can tell, okay, so these are kings then. A second, another thing is also that these have to be one world kingdoms and one world kings. That's how we limit the kings. How do we know that? Look at chapter 17. Chapter 17, verses 9 through 10. Chapter 17, verses 9 through 10. All right, let's examine all of these one by one. And that's going to represent one world kingdoms and one world kings. One world kings and kingdoms. That's how we're going to be able to find out these kings and these seven heads. The Bible says... <coughs> And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads, right? Keep reading. Are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are what? Seven kings. Five are fallen and one is. And the other is not yet come. And we, when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Okay, whatever the remaining half of verse 10 is, we're going to cover that later on. So don't worry about that now. But what we do know is that the seven heads, that they can re represent seven kings here. You see that? So there is no doubt these are representing the seven kings. Now, let's look at Psalm 74. Psalm 74. Psalms chapter 74. Now remember, during the time of Revelation 17... The whole world is under the rule of the Antichrist, right? So, what's divided amongst the world are these kings. See that? So, that's how we can tell that these kings have to be not just normal small Joes. These kings are actually worldwide empire kings. So, that's why we know that these kings are significant. A second clue is to understand that this is from all time. This is not just a future time period. These are one world kings and kingdoms from all time. How we can tell is that we look at the book of Psalms chapter 74. All right, look at Psalms chapter 74 verse 13 through 14. Look, this seven-headed dragon existed, okay? 
It existed during the time of Psalms. The Bible says right here, verse 13, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the what? Heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of who? Leviathan in pieces. Okay, so notice that Satan, we know that this is Satan, obviously, but he already had these kings, which we already admit, and these are one world kings and kingdoms. We can admit that. This was from all time. See? So it's not just a future time period of the tribulation. Because this was occurring during Psalms chapter 74. So that's why we know this is representing from all time. Past, present, and future. This will make a lot of sense concerning about God. God's time perspective is what? It's past, present, future. It's, he's not limited to a certain time bracket. Past, present, future will all revolve around him. Satan, the great uh, imitator of God, will also do that with his rulership, his kingdom, his dominion. He wants to cover all time as well. Now, let's also look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. This passage further strengthens the fact that these kings, directly from Satan, will have to be worldwide. These are worldwide, one world. So add this one with Luke chapter 4 and look at the wording that Satan says. Okay, no doubt these kings are in line, receive their kingship from who? Satan, right? Amen. That's what we can see from this picture and according to Revelation 12. So look how Luke 4 words it as. It's one world. Luke chapter 4 verse 5 through 6. What does Satan say to Jesus? Satan said this at Luke chapter 4 verses 5 through 6. Eh. There we go. The Bible says, And the devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him what? All the kingdoms of the world. One world. See, Satan owns it all. Now look what Satan says. Verse 6, all, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, right? That whole world empire is given to him, and to what? Whomsoever I will. I give it. Okay, one world kingdom, Luke chapter 4. Is that correct? Okay, so Luke chapter 4, verse 5 through 6. It's not limited kingdoms. It's the whole world. Satan says, I own it all. That makes sense. Satan owns it all. He says, I can give it to whomsoever I will. Revelation 12 shows that these kings were given that kingdom. Thus, we know this interpretation is true. That's how we're going to find the seven heads. Okay, so we see that so far. Now let's look at the first king. We're going to look at Genesis 10 and Revel uh, Genesis chapter 10. Genesis 10. Now I would highly recommend you to watch my video on YouTube, Seven-Headed Dragon and Ten-Horned Antichrist. Seven-Headed Dragon, Ten-Horned Antichrist, that would give all the verses. We're not going to look at all the verses because that is such a long lesson. But I want to give sufficient amount of verses. That way you can prove that this interpretation will be true. So I'm going to give you a huge chunk portion of the teaching, actually. All right, now, okay, so we have to think of the natural uh, logical reasoning is let's think about kings throughout all time who had one world empires. So let's start at the beginning. Who was the first one, right? So Genesis chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 8 through 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty, mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his what? Kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So the first one world kingdom is Nimrod. So that's... King number one. How do we know that it will have to be Nimrod? The reason why we know that this is going to have to refer to Nimrod is because if you read your history, secular, Christian, Alexander, Hislops, two Babylons, etc., there is no doubt that this Gilgamesh person or Nimrod was the first legend or the first hero or the first king that ruled above all kings. As a matter of fact, all gods and goddesses 
of religions of today and throughout all time originated from Nimrod. So this is the first king. But what's even more proven is that verse 10, his kingdom was what? Babel. Which city is going to play in the one world empire? Babylon. That's the same place. So there's no doubt it's Nimrod. All right, second one. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 29. Ezekiel chapter 29. Think about the kingdom that was the most powerful in the world that time. One world empire. All right, then the second one, if we're going to go through our history, what would make sense is Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Eat. Now, think about your history, all right? We're going throughout history. This sounds logical so far, right? The most powerful one world empires, world empires during that time. So the sequence seems to be going right so far. All right, this is found in Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 3 through 4. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against the Pharaoh king of Egypt, right? What is he compared to, though? The great what? Dragon. Ah, remember this dragon? So there's no doubt that it would be referring to Satan. Verse 4, notice he's like a Leviathan. See that? There's no doubt. Satan is a, a perfect type of Satan and the Antichrist. So Pharaoh definitely qualifies. All right, the third one. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12. The second one is Sennacherib, Assyria. Sennacherib, and that would be Assyria. All right, so I, let me put the locations as well. Now, this sounds logical throughout history so far, right? So before Babylon, it was Assyria. Uh, I'm not talking about Nimrod's Babylon. His was Babel. It was early days. Then went to Egypt, then Assyria, and then Babylon will be reclaimed. Okay, let's keep going. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12. Notice what Sennacherib is likened unto, or the king of Assyria. Now, during the time of Isaiah, Assyrian Empire under Sennacherib was conquering the world. So Isaiah, when he's talking about the Assyrian king, he, he would be referring to Sennacherib. Look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, okay, then that time period sounds what? Future, right? That's a future time period when God restores the nation of Israel. We can agree with that, correct? Now look what he, God is focusing on. I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the who? King of Assyria. Look at that. All right, let's look at verse 12, uh, verse 19, verse 19. And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, see, remnant of Israel who survive the Assyrian king's annihilation. Wait a minute. Remember our previous Revelation studies? The Jews are under annihilation persecution in the future time period by who? The Antichrist. Look at it again. Just like Pharaoh is a type of the Antichrist, one world ruler, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, is also a type of the Antichrist. There is no doubt Sennacherib would perfectly fit the bill then again. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 21, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Okay, let's also look at Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34. Chapter 51, verse 34. That's why it makes so much sense when God is talking about prophetic future time period, why did all of a sudden he would say Assyria? Why all of a sudden he would talk about Babylon? Why would he talk about these ancient kingdoms? Well, if you're a preterist or preterist, however way you want to pronounce it, See, they all try to put out a past time period. But if you're a dispensationalist, you're not limiting at a time period. You see that prophecy can go from past and jump to future. Why? Because in God's scope, he's not limited by time. 
Time doesn't matter to God. He sees everything at the same time. He'll see past occurring the same time as future, future happening the same time as the past. That makes so much sense when the Bible shows this seven-headed dragon that it's referring to all time and that it also has application to the future, not just the past. Why? Because God's all seeing it at once. That is incredibly eye-opening with the book of Revelation that I stress so many times is to have a dispensational mindset in interpreting scripture concerning prophecy. Why? Because dispensation, we divide the time periods and then we can see from proper context and then we can go from past and jump to future. But no, preterists, what they do, and then the amillennial, postmillennials, and post-trib tribulation, rapture people, etc. These people try to restrict it at one time period. Yeah. Remember double application? That is an undoubtable fact Amen. when you study scripture. If everything makes sense now, right? All the other verses then when you don't limit it to one time period, when you have a double application of past to future, why? Because God's not limited by time. He sees past, present, future, etc. all at once. Okay, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34. Okay, who's the next qualification? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a what? Oh, connected. Uh, who's connected to the dragon? Nebuchadnezzar. So in the Bible, it would be Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadrezzar. So there are two names. Either way could work. But Nebuchadnezzar, we can see right here that it would be Babylon. Building up the ruins from Babel, from Nimrod. And there is no doubt history proves that he, there is a world empire after the world empire of Syria. That was Nebuchadnezzar. All right, let's keep reading. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. Daniel 10, 13. Now, where are you going to learn this kind of stuff at church, huh? Not even an independent fundamental Baptist church will teach you this stuff. You know why? You know why? Because they don't, they don't study doctrine. They don't study the word. Man, it's a blessing to be a Bible believer, isn't it? Aren't you glad we're spending the hour studying this stuff rather than making Brother Sean speak in tongues for us during this service hour. Isn't that a blessing? That's such a blessing. Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it a blessing that Brother Ralph was not in the healing line and then I knocked him over the head that we spent our hour on that one? Man, ain't that a blessing, man? You want to spend time on this, right? All right. All right, let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia... Okay, so we know that is referring to Darius or Cyrus during the time of Media Persia. So it could be Darius or either Cyrus. But look at the wording here. This is not just a regular king of Persia. We know that this has to be connected to Satan himself. You might say, I don't believe it. Well, you keep reading. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael one of the chief princes, that's Michael the archangel, came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And that's an angel speaking to Daniel. See that? This is referring to Satan. This makes a lot of sense. It was Satan that the angel was versing. Why? Because with this ordinary king of Persia, who's the king? Who's the real king? This is just a human king, but who's the real king? It's the, it's the devil. There you go. That's why it makes sense when these names are mentioned, they're all connected to Satan. Why? Because it matches with Revelation 12. It's speaking about Satan, but he has these kings representing him. See how much of Scripture is making so much sense now, right? See? It makes so much more sense now. All right. Uh, here's another one. Let's look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Daniel chapter 10, 10, verse 20. But it's not just Persia who's connected. All right, let's look at another one. So we know the next kingdom, obviously. Mm -hmm. 
But look at this. This ain't no normal king either. It's something beyond that. Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return, the angel is saying, I'm going to return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the what? Prince of Grisha shall come. Look at that. So notice right here, we're still talking about on a spiritual plane here of kings and that battle going on with the king. But it's on a spiritual plane, not physical. So when Alexander the Great comes in, obviously he's the human king, but who's his ultimate daddy and the ultimate king? It's Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. So Alexander the Great... If you keep reading, especially on the book of Daniel, about where it talks about Greece taking over Persia's ruin, the, what the person that is focusing on primarily is Alexander the Great as a guy who just conquers kingdoms, treads them down, and conquers world after world. But not only that, he's the best candidate that you can think of that was what? Building a what? World empire. We got to keep thinking that context. That's how you can eliminate all the other kings and find out the best candidate of the king that time. So that's the best thing to do. But not only that, um, if you look at Daniel chapter, I'm not going to look at that passage, but you can look it up yourself. If you look at Daniel chapter 8, so a star here as a side note, you can double check with me if this is referring to the Antichrist, if it's connected to the Antichrist or Satan. You can connect that with Daniel chapter 8, verse 21 through 23 and verse 25. There's no doubt when you read this whole passage that the Antichrist comes from one of the four branches of Alexander's Grecian kingdom. It's born out of this. So there's no doubt Greece is connected to that and Alexander the Great is connected to that world empire. All right, but let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 7. All right, the next one. As they would say, hail Caesar, Rome. And guess what? That power continues today. That power continues today. It just transitioned into a different form. Throughout history, the two countries you will hear your pastor keep emphasizing over and over again. You pay attention to Egypt and Rome. Egypt and Rome, Egypt and Rome. They undoubtedly play a great significant part throughout our history, those two countries. All right, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 7. Okay, how do we know that it's referring to Caesar. Well, the Bible says over here at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and verse 7, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, okay, the future time period, right, that day that we're all waiting for, except there come a falling away first, see, apostasy, and that what? Man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. All right, so we all know that's referring to the Antichrist, right? But look who follows in the context of this Antichrist, all right? Now think about it. Who's the one world emperor, ruler that time during Paul's time? It's Caesar, right? Could it be that the one world ruler during Paul's time is within the same context of the Antichrist? Yeah, Paul said so. Because look at this. He's, he realizes the Antichrist is the future, but he realized it's already working. Because look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth what? Already work. See, that Antichrist is already here. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So, let's be honest over here. Uh, who's the best candidate during Paul's time? Who's a one world ruler and already at work? paving the way for the Antichrist who will take over the one world empire. It's Caesar. So there's no doubt Rome definitely qualifies for the seventh head. All right, so we got the seven heads down. Whew. Amen. Now, the ten horns. All right, ready for this? We're going to have fun. Okay, let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Now let's figure out these ten horns. Oh, it's too abstract. You'll never understand, you know, what this means throughout the Scripture. No, you just don't study enough Scripture. Amen. You study Scripture, you'll be amazed. The answer will, it will give to you. Okay, so let's match up these kings over here. So, right here, and right here, and right here. Now we got to figure out the horns. Hmm. 13 verse 1 through 2. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Look at that. It kind of imitates the anti, uh, not the antichrist, it imitates Satan the dragon, right? But this one is referring to the beast now. So this beast rising up out of the sea. Now, we know who this beast is. If you keep reading, that's referring to the antichrist. I'm not going to waste time talking about it, but... Um, if you read the later verses, and you'll notice this is definitely referring to the Antichrist, okay? So here comes this beast that comes out. Now, what is this beast? Let's keep reading over here, okay? <clears throat> this beast, uh, seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, what? Ten crowns. Did you see that? Okay. Remember Revelation 12. Satan the dragon, he has seven crowns on top of what? Not the horns. It's the heads. If you don't believe me, look back at Revelation 12 and double check me, okay? It's on the heads. But these crowns now with the beast, you'll notice it says upon his horns ten crowns. Ooh, wait a minute. Then that means it's not just seven crowns on top of seven heads. It's also ten crowns on top of each horn. What does that mean? Ah, then we know what this means, okay? From previous learning, that means these are ten kings. That's who these ten horns are. Oh, now I see. All right. But how does this work now, right? How does this work? Hmm. Well, we got to figure out. So let's look from previous experience. Notice that this beast who has, uh, man, I don't want to draw the heads and the crowns over here. You know, it's just too much work. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write ten heads here. <laughs> uh, seven heads, excuse me. All right. Seven heads. And seven heads and ten horns. Okay. Seven heads. Uh, excuse me. Ten. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I'm, I'm asleep today. Okay. Ten horns, and within these horns, it's crowns as well. Okay, however this would look, right? So we're just going to go this way, all right? <laughs> so use your imagination, okay? It's just too much work, okay? All right, so that means then this is going to have to follow the pattern like this, right? If it's going to follow the same pattern like this, then we already know. These will have to be one world kings and kingdoms. See that? That logically makes sense, correct? Why? Because it's the same thing like the seven-headed dragon. Everything's the same thing we see right here. So if we're going to find the little distinctions here with the ten crowns upon a ten horns, it's going to be natural logic to follow the same pattern. Now... Since it has crowns on the ten horns, they have to represent one world kingdoms. We can understand that. And this would make sense when we look at chapter 17, verse 12. Go back to, not go back, jump to chapter 17, verse 12. If you don't believe me, the scriptures prove it once more. And the ten horns which thou sawest, right, are what? Ten kings. Ah, so this explains the confusion of verse 10. Seven kings, right, not ten. But it's seven kings because it's referring to the heads here. But then uh, it says right here at verse 12, ten kings. The confusion is solved because what? Ten horns also represents uh, the kings as well. So there, that explains the explanation. So when we jump to Revelation 17 later on, you won't be confused, okay? All right, now let's look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. All right, we got to figure out these ten kings, Pastor. How are we going to figure this out? Can you help me out here? All right, so let's help you out a bit. Let's look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. 
So actually, we can knock off a huge number, perhaps probably up to seven, actually. So we can knock off a huge number already. You might say, why so? Because the horn, where is it rooting out from? Where is it coming from? The head. Ah, so because it's coming from the head, that means the horn will have the same kingdom as the head. Why? The horn is born out of the head. So its root and connection will be the same kingdom where the head is at. Now, if you don't believe me, look how Scripture brilliantly interprets Scripture about a horn popping out of the head that will make natural, logical sense that would be the same kingdom. All right, so let's look at this. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. The Bible says, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings. So the, one ram, right? But it has two horns. Are the kings of Media and Persia. And look at verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the what? First king. Now look at both of those verses. Both of those verses show that the horns that come out of this animal's head, it's rooted in that same kingdom. As a matter of fact, it's even so strong that in verse 20, Media and Persia are different kingdoms, but they come from the same root kingdom. That's why throughout history, they would usually call it Media Persia, not just Persia. So Persia is a more generalized term used, but to be more accurate, it's going to be Media Persia. Wait, I think I spelled that wrong. Yeah, wow, it is literally the news media. Okay, wow, it just, it just shocked me right there. Wow. Now you know that the media is definitely from the devil. Amen? Now we know that. We got scriptural proof. Media is from Satan. You can use that verse. Okay. I exaggerate, obviously. But anyway, no, I'm not. Okay, well, anyway, so <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. So we see right here that we already see the seven of the ten horns. Ah, we got it. So, right here is Babel, Nimrod. Right here, Pharaoh. Right here, Assyria. Right here, we got <coughs> Babylon. And then right here, we got uh, Media Persia. Right here, we got Greece. And then right here, we got Rome. Now, you notice what's missing here, right? You notice how I connected it? But there are three horns. See that? So what are we going to do to explain the three horns? Okay, let's use common sense. Obviously, just like Daniel 8, we saw the example. Daniel 8, we saw the example of the kingdoms being different, but from, they're from the same root kingdom, correct? Yeah. So that will make not natural, logical sense that these other horns... And this drawing is, act is accurate, how you do the horns, to be honest. Every head has to have a horn at least, okay? And then you can't get more than uh, two after that. So this is the natural, logical sense. This drawing is how you have to do the horns, okay? So if you have to do the horns this way, now the question is this, is that if we're going to think about these other three horns here, they have to come from the same root kingdom, and how do we know that it's going to be two? Okay, so let's look through Scripture. We're going to have so much fun today, aren't we? All right. Let's look. How are we going to start this one by one? Let's start it from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. So let's knock this off one by one and figure this out. We've got to figure this out. So all we know is that these kingdoms, which are different, are going to have to yet be parallel from the same root kingdom, okay, with these countries. Look how scripture lines it up for you. So let's start off with this fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7 and see how this works. <clears throat> Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. The Bible says right here, And four great beasts came up from the beast, diverse one from another. Okay, so we see that. Keep 
this in your hand and jump to Revelation 13.1. All right, now keep your hand there. We're going to look at occasionally. Look at Revelation 13.1. Scripture with Scripture. That's how you find the answer. Scripture with Scripture. You notice not a single Greek lexicon was used throughout this whole teaching. You'll notice not a single Hebrew lexicon was used throughout this whole teaching. You'll notice that <coughs> scholastic references were not used throughout this whole teaching. You'll notice it was through simply Scripture, purely Scripture. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Okay, this beast, right? Which is similar with this, right? He's going to have the ten horns with ten crowns on it, correct? So if he's going to have this, this, for, this beast of Revelation 13, so we put him as the Antichrist. Notice right here, this is the same beast of Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. Because this beast rises up out of the sea, correct? Look at verse 3. Now keep your hand at Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, okay? And, and four great beasts came up from the what? Okay. Remember that, all right? So this is undoubtedly the same beast of Revelation 13. That's what we get so far. Now, look at this. It has the diversity of the following three beasts. Okay, so let me explain one by one. Look at verse 2. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. One, his feet were as the feet of a bear. Two, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Three, there's your three there. This beast, Revelation 13, has the diversity of leopard, bear, and lion, correct? All right, go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. Okay, we see four great beasts coming out, diverse one from another. Now look at the sequence. Verse 4, the first was a lion, right? Ooh, look at verse 5. Behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. That ain't a coincidence. Verse 6. Beheld, and lo, another like a what? Leopard. Oh, there's no doubt. There's a connection with Revelation 13 beast with Daniel chapter 7 beast. Okay? These go parallel. Now, it said four beasts, right, at Daniel chapter 7? We saw three of them so far. It was uh, lion, bear, leopard. Revelation 13 says it's one beast that has the combination of lion, bear, leopard. Okay, this fourth beast, let's check out this fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. We're not lost, right? Okay, so let's look at this. Verse 7, after this... I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast. See that? It's the fourth beast. Uh, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. So this fourth beast is a humongous, like, scary beast compared to all the other beasts, right? It's, it's like the worst kind of beast Kind of like the beast of Revelation 13, right? Because that's a horrifying beast. So let's put beast here. That way, let's follow out the same text. But keep reading here. Is this the same beast of Revelation 13? Hmm. And it was what? Diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had what? Ah, Revelation 13 said... Ten horns. Not only that, is it, it is a diversity of beasts, right? Why? Because it had diversity of leopard, bear, lion. Daniel 7 said what? It was diverse from what? All the remaining three beasts. Ah, we know this has to be the same beast of Revelation 13. Okay, do we understand that? Okay. That way when I comment on Revelation 13 <laughs> over there, I won't have to go through all this process maybe. But... Now that we got this, what we got to figure out is this. The lion, bear, and leopard, this beast consists of these three animals. Now I got to draw this out. Okay. Leopard, 
bear, and lion. These would make up the kingdoms, right? There's no doubt these, each beast represents a kingdom. We saw that in Daniel 7, right? Okay, this three can fill out the remaining three over there. Okay, now let's think about this. The lion, bear, and leopard are three kingdoms that occur after Babylon. We know that. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible says, in the first year of who? Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Okay, so the king of Babylon was already ruling, and it was Belshazzar. Now, Belshazzar was one of the last kings of Babylon. So this was at the end. And then all of a sudden, you got what? Verse 3, 4, 5, and 6 about future kingdoms popping out. See, so it can't include Babylon. These kingdoms will have to follow after Babylon. Now, when you look at these heads, okay, Babylon is way over here past these other kings. Then what are the remaining three? Makes sense. That fills in the gap. It's from the same root kingdom of these three. Boom. How about that? Now, remember, these remaining three horns are going to have to match these three kingdoms. We can understand that so far then, right? Yeah, that makes sense so far. They have to be after Babylon. Now we got to figure out what, the, uh, what these kingdoms are. All right, so then, if we go by sequence at Daniel 7, we already got our answer, right? So the remaining three kingdoms, the remaining three kingdoms in Daniel 7, after Babylon, is Persia, Greece, and Rome. Following that sequence, then we know what the lion is. The lion, the first, who's the first one at Daniel 7? Lion, right? So it's the lion, so that's Persia, Media Persia. Who's after uh, the lion? It's the bear, so that would be Greece over here. And then we got uh, the leopard over here, that's Rome. Okay, so that's the right sequence, right? If you don't believe me, don't look at me like a tree full of owls and look at me draw and say, well, that, I don't get it. Well, don't look at the drawing. Look at the verses, all right? Look at the verses. What's the sequence? First is what? Lion. Second is bear. Third is leopard, right? What's the sequence here of these world empires that we saw after Babylon? Who's first? It's this guy, and this guy, and then that guy, all right? So you got your three missing kings there. This guy, this guy, and that guy. Okay, so now let's look at the passage over here. Now, when we think about this, the fourth beast, remember, at Daniel chapter 7, we got the first three beasts, but that fourth beast, which is a culmination of that, is the Antichrist at the tribulation. And he's a diversity of lion, bear, and leopard. We see that so far. Now, obviously, if we're going to think about this, this Antichrist, he comes out, right? In the tribulation. So he got the body of a leopard. Okay, if you don't believe me, look at Revelation 13. Body of a leopard. Feed of a bear. And then he's got, uh, I think, the mouth of a lion. Is that what it said? Let me look at it real quick. So let me double check. I believe it is the mouth of a lion. Yep. So verse 2 is the mouth of a lion. All righty then. So wherever I'm going to put the mouth at. Okay, so the mouth of a lion, feet of a bear, body of a leopard. Now, remember, there's no doubt this kind of kingdom who's coming out with ten horns, he has to include the kingdom of leopard, bear, and lion. That is undoubtable. He's coming out in the future tribulation with leopard, bear, and lion. So these kingdoms have to be included whether you like it or not, okay? Whether you like it or not, they have to be included. And when you compare that with Daniel 7, we already see uh, Greece, per Media Persia, and Rome filling in that gaps, okay? But now we got a situation here. The situation is, is that this is happening in the future tribulation, right? 
So because this is happening at the future tribulation, then these three kingdoms, these are ancient kingdoms. They're no longer available. They're ancient kingdoms. Okay, Darius or Cyrus is long gone. Alexander the Great is long gone. And Caesar is long gone. So we have to compare these three kingdoms from these roots and look at it at a modern day perspective. That's how you got to view these three kingdoms of Greece, Media, Persia, and Rome. You got to look at now these kingdoms from a modern day perspective that would fit the best candidate of Media, Persia type of empire, a Grecian type of empire, and a Roman type of empire. So that's what you're going to have to do. Now, let's look at Revelation 13 verse 2. The lion then that would match up the best with Media, Persia at today's time period would be England. Here is England. You might say, why is that? Because look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. It's what, it's what part of the lion? Mouth. It's speaking the language of a lion. Now think about a one world empire during the future time period that is like literally one world and the, and the best candidate. It's English right here, England, right? So we see right here England would fit the best candidate over there. And not only that, London's coat of arms is a griffin. It's a lion's body with eagle's wings. Look at Daniel 7, verse 4. Daniel 7, verse 4. All right. Nothing like scripture with scripture, right? Some of you are going, oh, what? Well, look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Please, look at your Bible. The first was like a lion and had what? Oh, nothing like a King James Bible that clears up the original languages for you, if you can find the original languages. <laughs> All right, so Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. You, you already got your answer there. Also think about this. Media Persia is the ancient empire that restored the nation of Israel. What country played a beneficial part in restoring the land of Israel, England. See that? Oh, look at scripture with scripture, okay? All right, anyways, now let's look at the bear. Okay, so Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, and Daniel chapter 7, verse 5. And you know what? I think that I'm going to have to end the teaching after I finish the dragon. So today's whole teaching was about the dragon today. Amen. All right. I had a lot of other good stuff, but we'll just jump to those next week, okay? Let's finish this dragon here. Okay. So Revelation 13, verse 2 is the feet of a bear, correct? Yes. Now, look at Daniel 7, verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it what? Raised up itself. See, it's using its feet itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it what arise devour much flesh this bear what it's doing is that it moves its feet wherever it moves with its feet it's going to devour all sorts of flesh and kingdoms and people around it see that the best candidate of the country that moved its feet around to arise and devour many nations is Russia. It's Russia. So now we see the bear is Russia. Also another thing is that it contributed its political power wherever it moved to devour nations with this saying, the bear who walks like a man. Did you look at Daniel chapter? Look, look back at Daniel. Look back at Daniel. And why did my hand just get away from Daniel 7, 5? Notice right here. Uh, Behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it what? Raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, what? Arise. Arise. What does a bear do? It walks up like this, right? Like a man. How about it? Why? It's about to devour flesh. Communism in China, North Korea, Vietnam, Cuba. And think about the constant ba power battles of technology, space, and politics with U.S. from 1900s even up to today. There is that power conflict, conf uh, competition, and struggle. 
Also, Russia's famous symbol from communist Soviet Union to today is the bear, actually. How about that? How does it match with ancient kingdom of Greece? Is that it continue its power of the Greek Orthodox religion. Wow, nothing like a King James Bible that clears up all misconceptions. See, that the, or, the Orthodox Church, you know what it brags itself to be? More ancient than the Catholic. They brag themselves to be more ancient than the Catholic. The Greek Orthodox Church, but it, the primary religious system in Russia, one of the primary religions is a Greek Orthodox Church system or the Orthodox Church system, but originally Greek Orthodox. See how the ancient carried on to modern? There's no doubt it's connected the ancient to modern kingdoms, but it transitioned its power. There's no doubt. This is undoubtable throughout scripture. Not only that, who's the guy who could not stop moving around to arise and devour many nations during the ancient days? Alexander the Great. Boom, 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 boom. All right, now let's look at the last guy, all right? Revelation 13, verse 2, its body was like unto a leopard. See that? So remember, the Antichrist beast, it is an integrated body, right? Its integrated body is a leopard. Think about the best country with an integrated body of people. United States of America. How about that? It is the best candidate within the entire world for the Antichrist to mainly use as his kingdom for the tribulation as well. Notice also, if you think about the leopard's three colors, it matches with the three racial colors within Sociology 101. But because of multicultural sensitivity, we want to amend the stuff now because the color might offend a person. But no, okay, look, it's undoubtable, okay, we all, okay, even multicultural sensitivity classes, they all admit this. Even though we try to be respectful of each other's nationality, ethnicities, deep down inside there is something innate that's racist within us. Even a multicultural sensitive counselor, they're taught to t think that way. Mm -hmm. See, so it is innate within all of us. There is no doubt we all know there is a distinction, okay? So... This was taught as Sociology 101, actually. Mongoloid, Negroid, and Caucasian. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Think about the three colors within the leopard. Yellow body, black spots, white belly. How about that? So notice that the best candidate uh, for the leopard is America. And we already saw throughout the scriptures that the leopard would have to refer to Rome following Daniel's vision and dream. Okay, now, ooh, let's see here. So then we'll cover uh, the other verses at Revelation 17, about five are fallen, one is standing, etc., etc. Uh, I probably quoted that verse wrong, but that will be explained at Revelation 17 when we jump there at the future. And that's going to be really interesting, okay? But we're still stuck at Revelation 12, so let's go back there and let's close it off. All right, how was today's teaching? You learned a lot? All right, so now you know the seven-headed dragon and then the ten horns, what they represent. Now we know what they are. <clears throat> Let's look back at Revelation chapter 12. So we see this great wonder in heaven. It is what? Seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And then when we jump to Revelation 13, it's ten crowns upon uh, the ten horns. Verse 4, we will cover... Next week, we only covered one verse today. Amen. Think about a church that would cover one verse but talk this much through Scripture with Scripture with Scripture, huh? Amen. How about that? All right. Who are these satanic kings with one world empires that the Antichrist will use? Nimrod, Babel, Pharaoh, Egypt, Sennacherib, Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, Darius, Osiris of Media, Persia, Alexander the Great of Greece, Caesar of Rome, carried on with today's modern time with England, the USA, and Russia. Makes you think twice about our country, huh? 
Yeah. I take great pride in my country. Well, you know, you can look at some of the good things that they did, obviously, and how God used it. But good night, nurse. There's a lot of flaws, a lot of corruption. And that is the number one country the devil will use for the future time period of the tribulation. You notice what Satan goes for? He goes for the countries that God mightily used. He went for the nation of Israel. And that's why you see a lot of conspiracies with that in the elites and banks and stuff like that. Then he went for America. Why? Because that's the heart of... So notice that two countries which talked about two principles in the Bible, two groups of people, the Christian church and the nation of Israel. And Satan attacked literally both of their communities. That's what he aimed for. He aimed for the heart. And he's going to use that for the future tribulation. Why? To try to smack at God's face. That look, I can take away, I can take away from you. But he loses it all at the end. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application.
King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> but you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting, screaming, and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Whoa! Unto the wicked! I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Shame on you if you don't read God. Shame on you if you don't witness with Jesus Christ. Shame on you. I'll have to whip that smile out of you. This effect, our fault, this effect that we're in Christ will never see hell is enough to shout about it. Give me your power, Lord. You know what we need? We need people to fall on their knees. We need people to pray to the Lord, raise the King James Bible high, believe the dispensational truth, and Lord, I just don't want their power. I pray like Elisha, double the portion, Lord. Give within me, do within me the filling power of your spirit. Give me your power, Lord. Give me your power. Give me your power. And God, the Holy Spirit, will move upon this church and fill within him his Holy Spirit power. Amen. Then we'll see soul saved. Then we'll see God do something with this truth. Then we'll see the liberals and the homosexuals getting up there. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, uh, we have not seen such a thing. Brother, sister, there's only one hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the man God, Amen. our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.